Welcome everyone to another Way of Life podcast here tonight. If you want to come on through, if you're here in person, and welcome to you who are joining in online. It's uh, We've got an awesome podcast for tonight. So just straight off the bat before I get uh, introducing John, our guest speaker for tonight, um, we're going to be doing the Q&A like we normally would, um, but we're not going to actually have a little break between it um, because uh, we want to make the most of this time that we have. Um, and so... If you're wanting to put in your questions to John about this particular topic, or about his book, um, you can go on to slido.com. It's going to be on the, um, it'll pop up if you're online um, on, as a little tab, or if you're here in person, it's just on the screen at the back there. And there's a code to get you in, which is 25011189. 8-9. So make sure you put your uh, questions in, um, and then we'll have it hopefully about 15-ish minutes to uh, dedicate to that. So our guest speaker for tonight is none other than uh, John Dixon. Um, so a little bit about John Dixon. He, uh, John is the, uh, a religious historian with a particular interest in Christian history. He has a degree in theology and a PhD in ancient history. He's the author of many books, such as the popular Doubter's Guide series that you often see at Kurong and online, one of which came out very recently, which we'll talk about at another point. And of course, the title book that we're looking at tonight, Bullies and Saints. So he was with uh, CPX, the Center for Public Christianity, one of the founding members of that for quite some time, for over 10 years, I do believe. And he runs an awesome podcast called Undeceptions. Um, if you haven't heard of it, make sure you subscribe to it. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I've really loved and enjoyed that. Um, it's such an honor to have him here tonight. So uh, John, it's uh, great to have you. How are you going tonight? <laughs> Um, well, thanks so much for having me, Matt. Ah, oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Hey, um, this is such a random thing to kick off with, but I actually read Bullies and Saints. I didn't actually read it first. I listened to it on Audible. <laughs> and I, this is going to be a weird thing to say, but you have like a, such a nice voice to listen to. Like you made history <laughs> even more interesting. So there you go. <laughs> um, so the voice wasn't so nice it put you to sleep? No, no. It kept me engaged, but it kept Good. me soothed at the same time. Anyway. <laughs> Excellent. Glad to hear it. Um, so I personally obsessed over this, this book for a a little while in a healthy way over a good course of a couple of months I really loved it I I did uh, history at Bible College obviously church history um, but I loved this kind of different kind of look at it um, in the sense of looking at the, the honesty of what's kind of some of the good that's come out of church history and some of the the, the real evil and the bad as, as the title says um, and I think, honestly, I found it so fascinating because I got so many questions from a lot of my uh, friends that aren't Christians, um, and they're like, they have these kinds of questions of some of the evil that's happened in, in the name of Jesus throughout history. So, awesome book. So, But I kind of wanted to hear from you just to get it kick off, um, just for those who might not have read it or have heard about you, um, but wondering what led you to write a book um, that's, that's so honest, that it kind of overturns what's underneath the dark past of church history at certain points. I feel like saying it was partly therapy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was right. Just, yeah, like... Um, being a historian um, means that I know the stories, uh, yeah. the facts and the figures, mm. and therefore where the bodies are buried. And there are a lot of bodies mm. in, uh, in church history. So, you know, working, working through that uh, it has been a project for many years, mm. I mean, ever since I really developed my, my interest in history. Um, I've had to just confront that... that um, that fallenness I see in myself and in mm. my peers and in my generation yep. uh, was also true of every generation in different ways. Yeah. Our, our foibles might not be their foibles, theirs not ours, yep. but they're everywhere. And so when I say therapy, I mean uh, just trying to understand it and put it in context and understand the factors that went into Christians departing from the way of Christ. Mm. I think the other motivation was uh, wanting something to say to the skeptic who thinks that these failings of the church are a reason to reject the whole of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And there are increasingly a lot of people who yeah. think this. Yeah. And I was involved um, 
10, more than 10 years ago in a, in a public debate uh, over this question of whether yeah. we'd be better off without religion. And uh, my side lost the debate dramatically. Yeah, right. And I came away that evening thinking, you know, there are a lot of people who aren't dumb who reckon the church has done mainly terrible stuff. <laughs> and, and, and I, you know, I wanted to be able to reply to that in a way that was honest and also pointed sceptical folks to, frankly, the, the, the beauty uh, mm. that Christianity has brought into the West, as yeah. well as, you know, the ugliness that is common to all of our humanity. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And I love you used this illustration and you were saying it was in like a, a documentary for the love of God. And um, I was wondering if you could tell that illustration of you playing the cello, um, because I thought mm -hmm. that was a brilliant kind of way of kind of trying to look at church history in a way. Well, um, you just think of your favorite musical piece. I mean, I, I, not everyone in the audience will be a fan of Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, you know, so you could use your favorite you know, pop song or whatever, but, yeah. but something, some majestic, beautiful melody, right? Yeah. Um, and I chose the Bach cello suites because <clears throat> real musical nerds reckon <laughs> it's, it's one of the most pure, brilliant pieces of mathematically aligned and elegant music ever mm. produced. And, and when you hear it, um, you know, it, I, I think if you have any appreciation for music, you, you love it. And, and, and my point is this, Bach wrote a beautiful tune. Yeah. And when you hear it played as it's meant to be played, mm. it's gorgeous. Yeah. But if you heard me play it, you know, I'm, I, um, I've had one and a half lessons on the cello. And <laughs> um, uh, if you heard me play it, you, you might wonder whether Bach could really write a tune after all. Mm. Um, but you know to separate it out the original composition from the terrible performance. Yeah. You don't judge the composition on the basis of my terrible performance of it. Yeah. You, hear, you hear it at its best and then you can say, ah, that's, I, I can work out whether I like that tune or not. And, yeah. and of course, it's an analogy. Uh, it's yeah. just an analogy to Absolutely. say, Jesus wrote a beautiful tune. Yeah. Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. He mm. gave himself on a cross to embody that love. Yeah. And Christians have sometimes played it really well. They really have. And other times they've been right out of tune. Mm. Sometimes, sometimes playing a completely different tune. Yeah, absolutely. And I kind of want to, I thought that was a really cool way to, to look at it because obviously it's very real. And I want to ask a question a bit later about this because some of the stuff that uh, even the church recently has done or done in church history, it's, it's, it's very personal, it's emotional, it's, it's quite charged and it's hard to see kind of the original cello, uh, I mean, the original composition, sorry. Um, yeah. It's hard to see the uh, Jesus. But before we get to that, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of just camp out in your first little bit of your book, really, um, because I found that so fascinating. And then basically, if anyone wants to get it, which I think they should, um, they can do that after that. Um, so you talk in your book of kind of um, the kind of the first three centuries of uh, um, Christianity, kind of after Jesus is ascended to heaven, and it talks about like the pre-Constantine um, time. And in one of your chapters, you focus on some of the like the amazing things that actually these these Christians did and kind of the, some of the big things that concepts that we believe now um particularly in the west um that we take for granted and we kind of don't really know like the imago day like made in the image of god and the value of the sanctity of human life um and just the concept of love um and loving your neighbor and i was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about kind of what you researched there and because i found that fascinating to know that how, how far back that came from and it wasn't just kind of a new modern kind of concept. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, on the one hand, modern people think the idea of seeing everyone as equal and inestimably precious is either um, common sense and everyone through history believed it, mm. or we just invented it, you know, after the enlightenment when we all became smart, you know. <laughs> Um, and both are, both are untrue. The Enlightenment certainly didn't start this idea that we're inestimably precious, each one of us, mm. you know, whether you're rich or poor, boy, girl, whatever. Um, 
and uh, because it's centuries older than, than secular enlightenment. Yeah. Uh, and yet it wasn't believed in Greece and Rome. Mm. So those who say, oh, it's just what everyone would come up with if they're rational, the answer is not for a second. And, and we can prove it because you only have to look at the Greeks and the Romans who were very logical, especially the Greeks. Mm. And they had worked out that people aren't equal. Yeah. We're just not. Some people are better looking than others. Some people are richer than others. Some people are stronger than others. Some people are better in war than others. Some people, you know, and on and on and on. Yeah. And it just does not make any logical sense at all to say that the brilliant senator who's been a warrior and now is an elite Roman has the same value as the slave. Yeah. It just makes no sense yeah. to the Greek and Roman mind. Yeah. Um, and they, I reckon they would outdo every one of us in an argument about this mm. because they had, they'd thought this through logically. Yeah. Right? Um, now, of course, what, what we would say in the modern world is, oh, but, but, but we all, we're all equal because, um, and we might reach to the I don't know, Declaration <laughs> of Independence and Thomas Jefferson and all that, <laughs> yeah. you know, that we've, that we've uh, created equal mm. and endowed with inalienable rights. Okay. Yeah. That's an entirely Christian concept <laughs> that we <Yeah>. were created <laughs> equal. And that came into our world through the Christians who believed the Jewish doctrine of the image of God. Yeah. That is God had has made human beings, mm. men, women, rich, poor, uh, in his image, they bear his image in the world, which is mm. really just a beautiful metaphor. Yeah. Or they they reflect him in the world. Mm. They are like his children, just like kids reflect your image. Yeah. Uh, we all reflect God's image, and that's why we're infinitely precious, every one of us. Now, yeah. the early Christians took this Jewish concept, because all the first Christians were Jews anyway, and um, built an entire sort of community out of it. Yeah. Um, and that meant that people were equal. Uh, the slave and the free, mm. rich and poor, men and women. And this upended Greek and Roman society so that within about three centuries, uh, Christians had persuaded a significant portion of the population that this was true. And, um, <laughs> and, th and then that influenced the West. Yeah. So that, um, you know, wherever Christianity went, yeah. there was some version of this egalitarian view that we all now have yeah. that says everyone is equal. Mm. So um, the, the data on this is very clear. Um, this isn't just Christian apologetics to yeah. say this. Um, it's, a, it's a thought you find in all of the Christian texts. Yep. You don't find it in any of the Greek or Roman texts. And that's what uh, gave us modern secular humanitarianism, yep. which sees everyone as equal. Yeah. Um, the other is love. I mean, it puzzles people to hear that ancient people didn't think love for everyone mm. was noble or wise or practical. And certainly love of enemy was ridiculous. Uh, love your friends would be a good ethic. Yeah. Uh, the Greeks believed that. But the love of the enemy, it makes sense. Like we're so used to putting love at the center yeah. You know, as, as that's like the most important thing. All you need is love, right? Um, <laughs> you know, that, that's, a, that's a ridiculous concept in the ancient world. Yeah. But it came into our world because the Christians said God is love. Yeah. Um, and they showed it, didn't they, in, in various they different forms? Oh, boy. <laughs> um, yeah, it wasn't just a pious doctrine. Um, they, they turned it into uh, things like freeing slaves. So from the second century, we know that churches had a common fund that people, you'd come to church and you'd give into this common fund mm. in order to buy people out of their slavery. That's um, so cool. We know that the churches from the second and third centuries started to try and buy farmlands so that they could grow food for the poor. Yeah. And so the church owned massive tracts of land, yeah. not because they were property developers, um, <laughs> but because they were trying to grow food yeah. for the poor. Yep. Um, so the idea of church farms was very common in the ancient world. Christians started the first public hospitals, and we have the dates of it. It's around 363, a guy called Basil, right? Uh, Basil the Great, uh, who lived in <laughs> Turkey. He, um, 
he established in the 360s through to the 370s this massive hospital complex where everyone uh, could attend free of charge. Um, if you were sick and you would get Greek medicine, mm. you know, yeah. you know, good, the best, the best medicine that was available. Yeah. And this took off um, so that um, by the 390s, there was a hospital down in Rome, also run by Christians. Um, by the 500s and 600s, right, mm. uh, there were thousands of hospitals all right. around Europe because wherever Christians went, they knew one of their obligations was to build a hospital. Mm. And, bi and bishops who were meant to look after regions uh, you know, they're meant to be the Christian leader of a region. One of their duties, according to the canon or church law, was to build a hospital for yeah. the public. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I mean, I could go on and on, but yeah, they, yeah. like the Christians just, they believed everyone was made in the image of God. We are to love everyone, and therefore we do this kind of stuff, as well as try and preach the God of love. Yeah. Wherever they can. They, yeah. It's not like they were all just social lefties. Yeah. They, they, were, um, they, they were absolutely committed to caring for people practically yeah. and absolutely committed to persuading people. What they believed kind of actually came out and what they were doing. And that's, it was such a yeah. beautiful thing. And I wonder if that's uh, more in line with kind of playing the tune of, of Jesus in a way, uh, which, is, which is awesome. And you talk about this in your book, in the kind of particularly the first three centuries for uh, Emperor Constantine and how kind of super countercultural it is, as, you, as you've already told us. And, um, but not, I, I love it how they, they love not only just their own. They didn't love just Christians, but they actually mm. saw it as like, actually, I need to, I need to go throughout all, all this kind of land. I need to go everywhere and do this. But I love it how they, you kind of show that it's, it, it was kind of done to their own detriment in a way. Um, like they, they weren't safe. They weren't accepted kind of culturally for, for the most part. They were persecuted quite a lot and even killed and put into various different games and, and things like that. Um, so even, so they're doing this, they're showing their love for Jesus and how they, um, how they treat people, but they're doing it under extreme persecution. But then it's what I found so curious. This is one of my favorite chapters um, in, and it was about Emperor Constantine, believe it or not. But it seems like he just kind of came along and he's like the first Christian emperor and then everything changes. Um, and it's just this crazy difference. Um, and this is one of my favorite bits. And I found it fascinating, some of the kind of the awesome things that he did once he became uh, a Christian. And I was wondering if you could um, even just give us a few or however many you want to. But what, what was some of the stuff that he actually instituted that we kind of, again, see to this day? He gets a lot of bad press. People think, you know, when he became emperor, all of Christianity became you know, power hungry and, um, and violent and so on. And that's just not quite the case. Yep. He, so he becomes a Christian and, and I, and most of the sort of experts on Constantine agree that he really was a Christian. Mm. Um, but, but a Christian who was still the Roman emperor yeah. right? with, <laughs> with a great big tr centuries, uh, tradition of what it, what it meant to have to be an emperor. Yeah. So we, we can't compare him to your local Bible study leader, right? He, you know, or, or, uh, or Pastor Matt, right? Yeah. You know, because he, he needed to be shaped. Um, but, but he, um, he did uh, instantly change a whole bunch of laws mm. for the advantage of the poor. Um, he allowed uh, the church um, to be tax free. Okay. So instead of churches being taxed, for the income that they get, mm. they would be free to use the money they've got um, to, to spend it how they like. And his logic, and we have this in the actual laws, mm. Romans themselves that Constantine um, decreed, that this is because the Christians are looking after the poor more than anyone else. Yeah. And so to make them tax-free made sense. Now, the thing is, um, Jewish synagogues were all, already tax-free. So were philosophical clubs. So were the leather workers' unions. So it wasn't weird to make this church tax-free. Yeah. But the rationale for allowing the church to, tax, to be tax-free was so that they could do more charitable work. And yeah. boy, did it boom their charitable work. Yeah, right. He also ruled, this was interesting, that wealthy people, like elites in Rome, could not become ministers or bishops. Yeah. Because that would, that would spoil the church. Absolutely. 
I, 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 I like that rule. Um, he changed torture laws so that um, you could no longer uh, brand someone on the face for a crime. Mm. So, like, thieves would, would be branded, you know, with a hot iron. They were thankful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, um, and actually, Constantine's law says it's because um, the face is the image of God. Mm. Um, so That's it's the first time image of God enters into secular law. Um, he gave everyone a weekend. So we three cheers for uh, Constantine. I found he's that the fascinating. One. <laughs> yeah. So the whole idea that we have this weekend um, is because... He wanted to give people this time off. Um, he admits that he, he, he hopes um, people would use it to go to church, but th he didn't force anyone to go to church. Yeah. Because um, Sunday, of course, was a work day. Yeah, right? true. So Sunday was just the first day of the week. Yeah. And the early Christians used to do church at 5 or 6 a.m. Wow. Before, before sunrise <laughs> so that everyone could go to work because it was a work day. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, right. But, but making the Sunday uh, day off yep. uh, meant that, you know, you could, go, you could make church at 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning yeah. and everyone had a bit of a sleep in. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there was more to it than that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he made divorce, divorce laws much harder for men to really screw over their women, yeah. um, which, which was happening all the time. Yeah. People were frivolous, frivolously divorcing their wives, yeah. which left them damaged goods in the ancient world. Yeah. And, 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 and Constantine arranged laws that would severely punish a man who tried to do that to his wife. Yeah. All I could right. go on, but... Yeah. Be. I thought it was good that he... Um, uh, what was it called? Uh, the practice of ex exposure? What did he do with, yeah. with that as well? He kind of... Yeah. He gave funds, basically, for them to take care of these, these unborn babies or these babies yeah, that had just so been born. Yeah, so it's hard, hard for us to get our head around that in the ancient world, people didn't have any problem, not just with abortion. I mean, abortion was happening all the time, mm. but so was infanticide or what, what was called expositio, that is to expose the child. And what they meant by that is you have your newborn and if it turns out it's a girl um, or if it turns out it's got a deformation or if you just decide you can't feed this mouth, um, no one thought it was morally problematic to take that child and leave it either in the rubbish dump mm. to be taken oh. by um, the elements or yep. the, the wild bogs, or just to leave it somewhere public um, in the hope that some other family who wants that child mm. will come pick it up. Yeah. Uh, and even if it was slave traders who, who would often scour the towns looking for wow. um, exposed infants. Now that was the norm. Um, and it's only really because of Christianity uh, that the law was changed. And um, it was because they believed that even this baby, this maybe a baby with a deformed foot mm. or a girl that wasn't considered as valuable as a boy, th this, this was in, you know, a, a being made in the image of God and so mm. needs to be looked after. Yeah. The Christians were picking up these infants yeah. and, and taking them home and looking after them as their own. Yeah. And um, Constantine uh, made a law uh, that basically gave funds to churches to continue this. They'd already been doing it for yeah. a century and a half. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> free, right, <laughs> awesome. at their own expense. But he actually made it financially um, easier for churches to do that. And it's really extraordinary. It, it struck me as I was writing about this, this ministry of the ancient churches mm. of picking up exposed infants. It dawned on me, that means... There are literally millions of people alive today yeah. that are only here today because they are the descendants of little babies that Christians saved. Yeah, that's so special. Mm. It's, um, it's interesting to hear like all of that. And you kind of picked up on it just before, but a lot of people kind of go, oh man, Emperor Constantine, man, that's where the church is from. <laughs> and just kind of fell apart. Um, but it seems like he did quite a lot of really good things. Um, I'm, I know he wasn't perfect. You do say that in the, in the book. Sure. Um, but I was wondering, like, what, what kind of happened after that? It's a big question, I know, yeah. um, and which you cover mostly in, in your book. But, like, what happened if he, he brought in such good things? And you were even saying in, in the book that he didn't kind of force people to do it. He was just making um, Christianity an accepted religion among kind of many other gods that they 
did often um, kind of uh, worship, but he just mm. didn't want it to kind of be persecuted. But what kind of what happened then to kind of get to these dark ages where, and I want to get to the Crusades in a minute, but how do, how yeah. do we get there? Ha-ha. Woo. Um, <laughs> so you're right to point that out. Constantine didn't make Christianity the formal religion of the Roman Empire. Mm. That didn't happen uh, for about 60 years after um, after Emperor Constantine. Um, but, yeah, he just made it legal. Okay, so that's cool. It, it, just, it just ended up having the status of Judaism or the pagan, yeah. know, the pagan worship of other gods. Um, he did, however, uh, favour it. So he, he did, um, we have these lovely writings from Constantine where he says, I, all, I want you all to become Christians. That would be fantastic. But I know that if I forced it on you, I'd actually turn you against Jesus. So I'm not going to. <laughs> He's a wise right? man. <laughs> <laughs> so fair enough. Um, what happened? Um, I don't think it was really Constantine that changed everything. What happened after Constantine? So Constantine dies in um, 337 AD, right? Yeah. And then there are a few other emperors. And then there's Emperor Julian in 361 to 363, who was a pagan and tried to reverse everything, mm. tried to shun the Christians and yeah, shut right. down the churches and so on. And just in this two to three year period, he, he almost reversed all the good work that had been done wow. uh, prior to that. And I mean, Christians had to leave their, their jobs if they were had an imperial jobs working in the court. And many, many Christians worked in the imperial court by then. Yeah. Uh, they all got sacked. Um, wow. So th- it was terrible. And, and then he, he died randomly on the battlefield as a young man in the year 363. Yeah, right. And Christians went, oh my goodness, in two years, we, we almost lost, you know, Everything. 50 to 60 years of amazing work. Wow. Um, let's never let that happen again. And I think from that point on, Christians became a little more bullish. Yeah. And there were, there were characters like Ambrose uh, in Milan, who had been a Roman senator and governor mm. and was parachuted in to be the bishop of Milan. Mm. And he was a great guy, articulate, great preacher, mm. um, Beautiful songwriter. He actually wrote songs everyone would sing. He was a champion of the poor. Yeah. He was also a bully. <laughs> he yeah, also, right. uh, he approved of the burning down of synagogues, for wow. instance. Um, wow. he, he bossed the emperor around once or twice and used yeah. his sort of church authority against him um, and trained other ministers to be more like that. Mm. Um, now, don't let me bag him out too much because he actually did great good. And if you asked a poor family in Milan in, you know, uh, say 390, what do you think of Ambrose? They'd say, we love him. He's, He's a champion. <laughs> but if you asked a pagan Roman senator, yeah. what do you think of Ambrose? They'd say, He's such a jerk. <laughs> He's always <laughs> getting his way. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what to do with that, right? Yeah. I just say, it's, a, it's an interesting picture because yeah. when the church had power, it actually was able to do more good. Mm. It also made the church a little more vulnerable to yeah. doing evil. Yeah. And I don't know how to square that. It's yeah. just a paradox. Yeah, absolutely. And so after that period, you get more and more people like Ambrose, who are sort of very well-to-do and bishops, mm. and, they, and they begin to boss people around for Jesus. Mm. And um, they thought they were doing it for everyone's good. Um, but what it meant is over time, pagans, non-Christians, were being sidelined. Mm. They weren't getting the jobs. They, so Christians became the persecutors. Um, wow. 100, 150 years after uh, Constantine. Yeah, and you had talked about even um, initially the, the tax break that they got was meant for, for good, so they could use it for good, and then often people would, um, like in their wills type of thing, they'd hand over like large sums of money or land yep. to the church in order to use it for good, but then it mm. kind of, as it got a little bit more corrupt as it went along, if I can say it that way, they ended up with just a huge amount of, money and power and that type of thing so yeah and yet the beautiful thing is as much as that happens um god always seemed to raise up a reformer Mm. um you know so there'd be there'd be benedict uh who uh was sick of the opulence of roman christianity yeah um in the fifth century and he, and he just took himself down south and, and set up a monastery, right? The Benedictines, right, came, come out of this, yeah. where he had this new rule for what Christians ought to be doing. And it was really about caring for the poor and so on. Yeah. Um, and 
he reformed everything and pe- people flocked to him. Yeah. And then, of course, century after Benedict, uh, <laughs> they'd, they'd, you know, churches would sort of forget that and start buying more land and building things and, and becoming opulent. And then God would raise up another reforming, yeah. you know, preacher like Bishop Evaligius in the 600s in, yeah. in France, who, who said that everyone, every rich person should be using their money to buy slaves to free them. Yeah, Not right. buy slaves to have them, <laughs> yeah. buy slaves to free them. And he himself would go to the marketplaces where slaves were being sold all around Europe, yeah. buy them and free them and give them travel money if they wanted to go back home. Here you go, buddy. Um, <laughs> yeah. right? so, so, so this is what I'm saying. Like, yes, Christians suck. Right, And there are whole periods where Christians are doing terrible things and God always raises up a reformer mm. who says, hang on, this, this doesn't look like what we're meant to look like. Yeah. And, they, and, and, and to change the analogy, they would sing the beautiful tune of Jesus and yeah. people would begin to sing along with yeah. them. So it isn't the case that it was all good, then it was all bad. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just this weird, secular thing. There is within Christianity a self-corrective. Mm. And, and, and praise God for that. Absolutely. Ah, so good. Um, it's good to see the kind of ups and downs of it all, that it doesn't just stay particularly low the whole time. I, I do want to touch on, I know, I know this takes a lot more than just this one question, so just do your best, but I get a lot of questions about the Crusades. Um, mm-hmm. They're one of the kind of the kind of scapegoat, the, the pointing of the finger of how bad Christians have been. Um, and I've, I've heard, and I think you even say it in the book, I've heard kind of two sides of it. Some people are like, absolutely, like particularly the first one was amazing. Like otherwise, basically we wouldn't be kind of a Western nation if, anymore because Islam would have taken over and all this kind of stuff. Stuff. And then there's obviously the other side of it. It's like there, there were some horrible things in this and they shouldn't have done this and that type of thing. So I was wondering if you could um, at least tell us a little bit about the even the first kind of main crusade that you talk about and how do, how do we navigate that conversation? Because it doesn't seem um, totally clear as to kind of <laughs> how, <laughs> how to navigate that. Yeah, it is very complex and people need to be able to hold two things in their mind at the same time, right? Um, It's simultaneously um, possible to think that the Crusades were well motivated and that they were conducted in an evil way, Mm. right? So if you can get your head around thinking those two contrary thoughts at the same time, you'll do fine understanding the Crusades. But the build up to the Crusades is interesting. Um, as, as, as the church moved westward into Europe, into France and Germany and so on, the church itself adopted the militaristic culture and language of the pagans mm. of France and Germany. Yeah. Um, because they were warrior cultures, right, before Christianity came along. And Christianity, Christianity came along and converted them, but, but also tried to accommodate to them yeah. and, and sort of be quite soft on violence. And in yeah. fact, the church adopted a little more violence so mm. that by the time you get to the 10th century, right, sort of the 900s, and then into the 11th century, the 10 hundreds, the church is actually okay with war and with um, knights, you know, yeah. warrior knights uh, who travel around Europe yeah. um, doing protective services and so on. Now, that's the context, okay? Yeah. Suddenly, well, I shouldn't say suddenly, over in the East, okay, in you know, obviously Saudi Arabia, um, uh, Syria, down Israel, yeah. across to Egypt, across Turkey. Um, Muslims uh, had been incredibly successful military warriors mm. um, because, I mean, unlike Christianity, Islam was a militaristic religion from the beginning. Yeah. I mean, no one could say that was true of Christianity uh, from the beginning. Mm. But it was true of, of Islam. Now, this is not a criticism of Islam. And any Muslims who really understand their faith won't disagree with what I'm saying. Muhammad himself was a brilliant military warrior mm. and led armies into battle. That is just historical fact. Yeah. And they continued to do that so that um, by the late 600s and into the 700s AD, mm. Muslims had taken over everything from Saudi Arabia to Syria to Israel to um, Egypt, 
uh, across North Africa to Spain. Yeah. And they had pushed, if you can think of where Turkey is, right? Yeah. They had pushed west from Syria through Turkey, making their way. And see, Turkey had, was thoroughly Christian. All these lands were thoroughly Christian. Yeah, Egypt, okay. North Africa, Israel, they're all thoroughly Christian in this period. But they'd got rid of that. And the Muslims were pushing toward Constantinople. Hey. This, this, is the, this is the city in the east of Turkey um, that was the capital of the, the Christian empire that we call the Byzantine yeah. Empire. Mm. And, um, and it had been a, you know, an immense empire, but it, it, all, it was at the point of falling over. Yeah. And at that point, the emperor, the Christian emperor, of Byzantium, <laughs> yep. wrote to the Pope and said, help. Yeah. The, the Muslims are successful everywhere they go. They are knocking on our door. They will take Constantinople. And once they take Constantinople, they'll take Greece, they'll take Italy, and it's all over. Yeah. And the Pope um, started a preaching tour uh, around Europe, preaching a crusade, mm. which comes from the word... Uh, cross in Latin, yeah. okay? So a crusade is taking up the cross. And they sincerely believed what they were doing was stopping the onslaught of Islam, crushing their Christian brothers and sisters in the East, mm. and preventing them from going any further West yeah. into Europe proper. Yeah, yeah. So that was, that was the sort of logic of the crusades. Yeah. And uh, Pope Urban II made a good case and thousands upon thousands of people volunteered yeah. to take up the cross, which literally meant, literally meant a, a, a patch, yeah. a, a cross patch that you would take and you would vow to give your life yeah. in service. Now, they went over in 1099 and surrounded Jerusalem and in one of the most extraordinarily quick battles, uh, July 15, 1099, they took over Jerusalem, yeah. the, the capital of where the Muslims had based themselves. Yeah, right. And they won. But in winning, they slaughtered men, women, and children, which mm. broke every rule of Christian warfare yeah. for the centuries before that. At least Christians up to that point had said, you don't kill women and children. Yeah. And they were brutal. And we have the primary records. We have the letters home from the Crusaders. So yeah. this, we don't have to rely on exaggerated you know, Muslim accounts of what the Christians did. The Christians were brutal and awful, yeah, wow. evil. No, no matter how mm. just you might say, their, their cause was, yeah. the way they conducted themselves yeah. was a blasphemy mm. and has left, you know, a mark in sort of Muslim memory of how evil crusaders can be. Yeah. Now, that's just the first crusade, right? Yeah. There, are, there, are other, there are other crusades yeah. that go backwards and forwards. And, um, you know, they are a weird combination of good motivation to sort of push back the Muslims, um, you know, to sort of regain territory that used to be Christian, to protect fellow Christians. Yeah. You know, like, they, they, I can understand that. Yeah. Um, but the way they conducted mm. these wars... Um, I think leaves the, the Crusades as a scourge on yeah. the history of Christianity. Yeah, absolutely. I'll say one more thing, if I may, about Yeah, absolutely. Go. It wasn't secularists who got rid of the Crusades. It wasn't, you know, just that people suddenly stopped believing in God and, and, and decided to be good atheists and we should get rid of those Crusades. No, it was Christians who got rid of the Crusades. Yeah, okay. And it was Christian reformers who said, this is not how we should be <laughs> resolving these kinds of disputes. Absolutely. Um, and, and so again, yeah, as evil as it was for the Crusaders to do what they did, the way they did it, mm. it was Christians who self-corrected and got rid of the Crusades. Oh, so good. It's a, it's a tough reality to kind of chat about, and this kind of leads to one of my questions I was alluding to before, because it seems sometimes it can be quite a justice issue, it can be a real close to people's hearts or they can't fathom how someone could go so far away from the tune of Jesus and they kind of connect the two. It's kind of like, well, Christians did that, so therefore Christianity isn't great and I'm not even going to consider Jesus. So when you've got some of the bad points in history, um, how do you kind of, and this is quite a broad question, I know, but in your experience, because you, you have quite a number of conversations with people, 
Um, how do you have an open conversation about this where you're honest, where you're like, absolutely, that was horrible, but then kind of actually still somehow show Jesus and hmm. the good that's happened? Um, it is both difficult and simple. Um, it's difficult because there's just so many bad, you know, so many bad stories to, to deal with. And so yeah. a lot of your time, if you're talking to someone who's knowledgeable, mm. a lot of your time will be going, yeah, it was pretty bad. And in fact, it was probably worse than that. Um, <clears throat> often, often people don't really know the details. They'll just say the Crusades and the Inquisitions and as if, you know, that ends the conversation. Yeah. You could always ask someone, oh, so which, which crusade and what do you mean and so on. Yeah. Um, so it's compl it's complicated. However, I always just ask people, um, which which is truer to Jesus in your view, um, mm. the fighting and the raping and the pillaging, or the building hospitals and freeing slaves? Mm. And and everyone, every skeptical friend we have, yep. will instantly go, well, it's obvious, of course, yep. you know, the, the charity and the hospitals and all that. Yeah. That's truer to what Jesus called for than the violence. And then so so then my point is. Well, then your problem isn't with Christianity, is it? Your problem is that Christians weren't Christian enough. Yeah. So the, the thing that would resolve the Crusaders, all the, you know, the evil they perpetrated, would be if they followed Jesus more. Yeah. So your problem isn't with Christianity. Yeah. Your problem is that Christians haven't been Christian enough. And we admit that every day. Absolutely. Right? <laughs> the, other thing I, I like to, yeah, the other thing I like to point out to people is um, if you ask yourself, what is the unique contribution of Christianity? It isn't warfare or torture or bigotry. Those things were everywhere in ancient culture. Mm, that's they're, true. Every, they're everywhere today too, yeah. right? Um, so those, when Christians are doing those things, they're just doing the things that are common to everyone. Yeah. It's sad. It's terrible. Absolutely. I'm not justifying it. Yeah. But, but these are the things that are common to humanity. Mm. They're not the things that are unique to Christianity. Yeah. So here's, here's the thing. What is unique to Christianity? What is the unique contribution of Christianity to our world? It is all these other things. Yeah, absolutely. Equality, humility, charity, hospitals, education for all, yeah. freeing slaves. These things were not common to Greece and Rome and Egypt and so on. Yeah. These were new things that Christianity brought into the West and transformed the West. So... When Christians are true to their own unique heritage, mm. they, they will follow the path of love. Yeah. When they depart from that and do terrible things, they're doing what is common to our humanity. Yeah. That's a really cool way of putting that. Um, if everyone wants to put in any questions that they have in, I'm going to ask them one real quick last little bit. Um, I'm curious, what is... And this isn't really in your book, but do you think there's a way in particular that comes to mind where the church is being a bully today? Huh. huh. <laughs> well, I'm not a prophet, you know, I'm just a historian. So yeah. that's above my pay grade. Right? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, but the thing is, being a historian, um, you know, the main experience emotionally of reading all about this terrible stuff the church has done isn't, oh my goodness, how could they have done that? My real emotional um, response is, wow, I wonder what my blind spots are. I, I wonder what mm. 100 years from now yep. people will say about me mm. and my culture. Will they look on our version of Christianity mm. as so materialistic as to be evil, so driven after money and mm. so on that, that we're hardly Christian? Because this is one of the things that was quite rare in the history of Christianity. Yeah. Um, um, Christians generally in the history of Christianity were devoted to the poor. Yeah. They were the champions of the poor. Yeah. Even in the worst periods of church history, they were champions of the poor. And as we lose that reputation and become, you know, as materialistic as anyone else, I think maybe there uh, we're, we're the bullies Yeah. Um, around the use of money. I also think the treatment of... Um, uh, well, the the child sexual abuse scandals and the mm. way the church hid these scandals to protect its reputation. Yeah, I think these will, you know, be looked back upon. Yeah, the way we look back upon the Crusades. Yeah, and maybe Absolutely. even worse. Yeah, well, it's even more 
of a, uh, a motivation to, to be not saints, but to be people that love Jesus and love our world around us, that we can actually be a people that um, write a good tune um, that, is, that, that images Jesus, that images God and, and what he has for us. Yeah. Um, if it's okay, we're going to go into some... Um, Actually, real quick, you've got a new book out. Um, did you want to tell us a little bit about that? The uh, Doubter's Guide to World Religions, I do believe. that That's really cool. I love all those other <laughs> ones you've done. They're so good. Thanks. <laughs> Look, it's, um, it's a friendly, fair introduction to the five major world religions. So Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And um, people will get uh, the history of these religions, They'll get a lot of the texts yep. of these religions, so people will know I'm not just making it up, uh, and a, you know a, a fair account of of them. It isn't it isn't a um, an attempt to show why Christianity wins or anything like that. Yeah, um, I've had Muslims read my Muslim sections and they agree That's that cool. I've I've been fair to Islam and Hindus wow. the same. That's awesome. Um, so it's really if you just want to understand the faiths. Uh, that, that's what it's about. The end of the book is a critique of pluralism. That is the idea that they're all the same. Yeah. I think you, you'll read the book and you get to the end and go, oh, there's no way they're all the same. Yeah. There's no way they can all be true. <laughs> yeah. I wonder which one is. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, that's really awesome. I, I grabbed a coffee from Kurong not too long ago, um, cool. which uh, I haven't got around to reading it just yet. But um, <laughs> make sure you guys buy that, support him and his podcast, in in buying his books and listening in. He's, he's uh, as we've seen tonight, you've, you're a phenomenal mind. Praise the Lord, and we love what you're doing um, for for Christians, but for those um, in the secular space as well, John. Thanks. Man.